Diana Hippie, welcome back to Criminal Justice 203 here at Sitting Bull College, our undergraduate interview and interrogation course. I'm your instructor, Kara Damari Amachia. Today we are going to be looking at victim and trauma-informed interviewing. A warning as we launch into today's content. Normally, I'm fairly cut and dry in class, but today we are going to take a very holistic approach. And I want to make sure that each of you is supported in your own trauma as we go through this or whatnot. Frankly, because talking about trauma, having these kinds of conversations, learning this material may very well bring to mind some of your own trauma. And far be it for me to think that any of us hasn't undergone something that might be traumatic. So we're going to be taking a much more uh, whole person approach today than we might usually do in looking at interviews and interrogations and various techniques that go along with them. Today we're going to be using the word victim. If you aren't comfortable with the word victim and you want to use the word survivor in your own practice and what you do, uh, or another such word, I, I wholly recommend whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, not necessarily every victim has the chance to become a survivor, unfortunately. And while we're not going to get too far into that today, because we are talking about these types of interviews, uh, we will, or I, I am, and you should be aware of that. So as we're going through today, if you need to stop at any point, step away from the video, or if you need a alternate assignment, please feel free to let me know. We are going to be going through a lot of available resources today. If you get in a situation, whether you're working in law enforcement or in the courts or in Department of Health and Human Services, CPS, another organization where you're working with a potential victim uh, or trauma survivor, there are many, many available resources for you. And so it might be that upon hearing of their trauma or working with that person, your mind kind of goes blank and just give it a Google, okay? Uh, one good spot to start might be, as with many of our classes, uh, the Office of Justice Programs. The Office of Justice Programs actually creates a lot of resources for police departments and other law enforcement to use. And so please do make sure you're utilizing them. They have a whole office within the OJP uh, for victims of crime, okay? And within that office, for victims of crime, there is a training and technical assistance center, which you can see up there. So within the training and technical assistance center, there are many types of like sort of e-guides. We're gonna be looking at quickly some information that's under human trafficking task force e-guide, but note that all of this information uh, isn't necessarily only related to human trafficking but might run, run the gamut and especially uh, we might consider during this victim interviewing and preparation part. So looking at uh, conducting victim interviews and we'll, we'll get more into this in a second. As this guide suggests, finding a comfortable location, all right? A location where the victims feel most comfortable and safe is a good idea. Last week we discussed how making eyewitnesses feel comfortable may lead to more productive interviews today. We're noting that victims as well, places in which victims find that they're not additionally dealing with other stressors may result in their ability to be more forthcoming uh, and generally more provide more assistance to your investigation if that's what you're 
doing or provide more information to the interviewer. So certainly there are victims' rights. Uh, be aware that there may be potentials for there to be a victim services provider in the situation. If that's the case, you have to be aware, be aware of confidentiality issues. You can certainly look those up for your own jurisdiction, whether that's with a specific tribe or a state or the federal government. Um, definitely look to victim advocates or other victims' rights uh, and the various regulations related to those within your jurisdiction. Many victims have had or may have fear of law enforcement. And that's something that we'll note today and we should be really conscious of, okay? Going forward, uh, we're talking here about human trafficking, but this is the case of not just human trafficking. It's a case where any community has an adversarial relationship where they're police department, for example, or with child protective services, um, child support enforcement, those types of things. If there is a natural distrust of law enforcement or others in the area, recognizing that and doing what is necessary to get any victim statement um, with that in mind is probably going to be a more successful result, right? So of course, uh, at the beginning of an interview, talking to the victim about making sure that they're safe at the time and then locating them within a sort of safe environment, making sure that they have or don't have uh, advocates with them as required by regulation and being aware that talking to you, talking to you in whichever capacity you're speaking with them in may be something which is scary for these victims. Uh, looking at sort of a victim-centered investigation, the Office for Victims of Crime has this nice chart here, uh, making sure that a safe victim, making sure a victim is safe how that positively impacts uh, investigations, recognizing that key role that the victims play in successful, particularly human trafficking investigations, but other investigations as well, and providing them with referrals to, to other task force victim service providers, uh, ensuring protection of their rights, et cetera. So be aware of these things as we launch into looking at victim interviewing. Quickly, some more points to remember as we launch into this, and I think I have one that gets pulled up here. Don't be surprised if the victim denies they're a victim, right? Many individuals, whether they're being human trafficked or are victims of other crimes, are handling that victimization in ways which may be surprising to some people, but ultimately uh, is what they, what they can and know how to do, all right? And so if an individual denies that they are a victim, it doesn't negate their victimization. It's, it's just something to be you know, not surprised by and understanding that this is, this is a common thing. They might be afraid of what's gonna happen to them whether it's in a human trafficking case where they're afraid of their trafficker, whether it's in a domestic abuse case where they're afraid of their spouse, uh, a child abuse case, afraid of a parent or guardian, all right? Your victim, as you interview them, may be dealing with uh, potential repercussions as well in their mind, all right? So they may be denying that they're a victim, they may be afraid of what's going to happen, or even afraid of what, what you're going to do to them, whether you're child protective services, law enforcement, whichever agency you're working with, that fear of what you might do to them or the people they love uh, is, is worthy of vision. Uh, they could be distracted, they could be angry, they could be reluctant, they could be concerned about their needs, they could be afraid of uh, what's around them. That's why finding a safe environment, if it home isn't a safe environment, don't do the interview at home. 
if school is in a safe environment, don't do the interview at school, right? If a, you know, locked interview room in a police station isn't an environment where somebody feels okay, consider not doing it there, right? Um, this notes, you know, if they've got unmet medical needs, um, for example, lack of sleep, if you're trying to interview a victim after uh, something has occurred and, you know, they haven't been able to had a ch have a chance to sleep that night yet, or, you know, maybe they've been going through some sleepless nights, there might be some other issues which uh, are medical. And as noted before, asking and, and ensuring the current uh, safety of your victim and of others is paramount at the beginning of any victim interview, right? Uh, and lastly, they list, you know, be, I don't know what B information means, but, you know, consider the victim's reality in advance of the interview. Uh, consider these factors. Consider if they are currently in a situation which maybe doesn't allow them to be as open and honest as uh, they can be, or if they are still really in the middle of what has occurred, at, at least in their mindset. And, uh, you know, be very conscious of where they are at. So there's some more information available via the Office for Victims of Crime on, uh, in this case, particularly trafficking victims, but related to all victims. And in other places, there are uh, other, within this website, other resources for victim interviewing. When you're looking around this website, definitely check out some of the other links that the office provides. They provide a link, for example, to the World Health Organization's ethical and safety considerations for interviewing trafficked women. I put a copy of that in your MySBC. There are a lot of useful resources on here, and I strongly recommend checking out any OJP resources as generally there's, they've been developed in such a way as to be, I think, pretty, pretty up to date. Uh, etc. So check out that website. And another website I'm going to guide you to for trauma-informed victim interviewing is the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Now, in Standing Rock, for example, uh, its own tribal government, uh, you know, there might be things that are you might consider are a little bit different among tribal police or BIA officers, or if you go to another tribe like Rosebud where there's tribal police, different in those environments than say urban environments, things like that. Well, the International Association of Chiefs of Police does a pretty good job at looking at a full spectrum of trauma-informed victim interviewing uh, across many locations. And so this is definitely a great guide. I've got a copy of this in your MySBC as well. We are going to start today by an exercise that is usually done in class. And we're going to be doing a little bit of back and forth based on some of the available resources that both the IACP and the OJP put out on the best ways to conduct an interview with a victim, okay? We've got our interviewer and we've got our victim, all right? And we're gonna see, uh, alas, these cannot be real people today, but um, you know, you can look to one of these guides if you'd like to practice with somebody who consents and who's been informed of the potential for to re-bring up trauma. Uh, so we're gonna start off as an investigator by asking a question, like, why didn't you? Why didn't you stop him? Or even, why did you? Why did you go to the store? All right. Now, those questions, they might be asked for purposes of clarification, but you have to be so careful as the interviewer in the situation to avoid faulting the victim. And have them feel like it was their fault because they didn't take a certain action or because they did take a certain action because they went to the store to buy milk 
um, and then were subject to uh, a sexual assault. There's not a correlation there, right? And so there's not a causation correlation there. So instead, asking maybe broad open questions, similar to when we interview eyewitnesses, right? Asking questions like, would you be willing to tell me a little bit more about what happened? Uh, maybe, you know, what were your thoughts and feelings? Why, you know, what, what went on there, all right? Asking those questions which allow the victim to articulate what happened in a way that they're comfortable with and not feel as though there was pressure for them to perform in maybe a way that they didn't. Uh, so that's a good start. As the interviewer, another sort of strong desire that many interviewers have is to put things in chronological order. Now, what do you think are some of the potential issues with chronological order? Uh, it's certainly nice. And we talked about with eyewitnesses, uh, having people go backwards through their memories as a sort of check on after the interview was finished, uh, their, what had happened in case they missed anything, sort of finding details. But generally when you start an interview, especially with a victim, especially with a um, victim of trauma, a good way is to say, you know, where do you wanna start? Where do you wanna start, all right? And if that person wants to start right at when it happened and then go back afterward in order to tell you, you know, how they got there or whatnot, you know, uh, not only is that their sort of right, but it's also potentially the place from which they might be able to provide the most or the best uh, information. And so if they start where they're comfortable with, if they, or if they start where they choose to, I should say, they're probably not comfortable with it. If they start where they choose to, then they may be able to go forward in the interview and provide a greater level of detail. Uh, don't be asking things like, you know, how long did that person do that to you? How long did the assault last is one of the examples uh, that the International Association um, of Chiefs of Police give. Uh, try to avoid questions like that. Those are Again, maybe looking for some sort of chronology to this whole thing, which it's very often the case that when people are experiencing trauma, time either might slow down or go super speed, right? So trying to get everyone on a constant chronological order may not be the most effective approach. Instead, questions like, what do you remember hearing during the event? Or, you know, what was happening you know, beforehand or what happened kind of after, you know, open questions, let them take you where their memory serves them and where they can handle going at that point. That's a good strategy. You'll be able to, to ascertain everything that they recall about the event, uh, but doing it in that way both allows you to potentially get the best information possible and provide them with a kind of respect and room that they might need. So we'll hit a couple more of these up. Uh, you know, oftentimes you've got to ask questions in interviews with victims about what they were drinking or smoking or what kind of drugs they were doing, okay? And so if you've got to ask those questions, there, it's just finding the way that you can ask them without blaming the victim the most, okay? Uh, maybe even communicating to them. You know, a you choosing to, to have something to drink doesn't mean that you chose to be sexually assaulted. You know, you might have been doing drugs and thank you for telling me what, you know, what was going on, but that doesn't justify you uh, being subjected to some sort of crime, okay? Talking with your victim in a way which doesn't put them in the seat of uh, the person who 
had either done something wrong or asked for something wrong to be done to them is again, the best way to kind of move forward. Say they went off with the suspect, they chose to go with them. You know, why did you choose to go with the suspect? Why did you go with the suspect is actually a very similar question, right? Again, though, the, the intent behind that question um, isn't really conveyed. What you're trying to figure out as the interviewer is what was the what was the deal here? Why did that person go with that person? What the victim might be hearing is, you know, why did you put yourself in this situation? Uh, a good way around that might be, you know, what were you thinking? What were you, or what were you, I'm sorry, not what were you thinking? What were you feeling? Uh, what were you thinking has a colloquialism about it that isn't helpful in, in this situation, but what were you feeling when you, when, when you headed off uh, with this person? You know, how did you feel at that time? Again, broad, um, you, victim controls the conversation, that type of thing. Did you say no? Did you say no, says the interviewer? Uh, not a great question, right? Uh, instead, how were, you, how were you feeling when you went into that room? How were you feeling when you got in the car? Again, all right. Uh, did you fight? Did you fight back? An easy question, a question that you probably want to know as an interviewer, maybe, all right? Instead, maybe, you know, what did you feel like you were capable of doing at that point? What did you feel like you were physically capable of, uh, of doing at that point? What did your mind do when it realized you were in danger? Uh, can you tell me what you remember or what you were feeling? All right. And we're using these feeling words a lot, but we are trying to provide, again, a safe, comfortable environment for the victim to share their recollection and the, the best way to get that recollection is not to try to hammer it out of them for lack of a much better way of saying that but is to let them and have them want to share what happened okay have them try to get to a place where they're not so stressed out and where they can openly and in a greater level of detail share so things that we want to consider did anyone see it happen? Did anyone see it happen? Oof, did anyone see it happen? The poor victim, something terrible has happened to them. Uh, and you're asking them like, well, who else got to see it? You know, did, is, are you sure it was real? Did, you know, did all these people get to watch this terrible thing happen to you? Ooh, maybe try questions like, can you tell me about any potential witnesses? Did you know anybody at that bar that night? Um, do you have any info on any friends you were with who might have noticed, uh, you know, a piece of what happened? You know, uh, who might have anything to add to this this discussion at some future point? Right. Good questions. We don't discuss this as much in interview and interrogation, but we did talk about this in undergraduate criminal law. One: Have you had sex with this person? Actually, we talk about it in undergraduate evidence and procedure too, right? Because it's a potential for character evidence and rape shield laws and all that stuff. But have you had sex with this person before? Uh, question interviewer probably really wants to know maybe, but a better way to say it, has this person done anything like this in the past, right? Because if they've had positive consensual sexual relations in the past, it doesn't necessarily serve as any background for the occurrence that happened that evening, all right? So has this person done anything like this to you in the past? Or could you tell me how this instance was different from these prior consensual acts, all right? You don't need to ask them about other sexual assaults, or you shouldn't, I should probably say, ask them about other sexual assaults that they've endured, if they have endured other sexual assaults. And don't, us, I mean, this is, a, this is a real thing, that with the amount of women that are women and men, um, but percentage-wise, significantly more women, who are subject to some sort of sexual assault, it's certainly possible and, and maybe even likely depending on the population that this person themselves has undergone prior, our victim has undergone prior sexual assaults. And there's no reason to bring any of those up. All right. They're already experiencing whatever they are from the current situation. Uh, and that's what we're focused on.
that's it sort of becomes a mm -hmm. like why is this happening to you thing when you bring up words like that and that's that's not helpful right uh whether they've been previously assaulted or not does not impact this this particular interview or investigation all right so so to recap for our in-class practice if we were in class we would actually go back and forth with this and you would have a partner your partner would ask you the first question in sort of the, the a more i don't know more obsolete way of saying something or less trauma-informed way i should say that less trauma-informed way uh you would report on sort of how you felt when they asked you that and then they would ask you in a more trauma-informed way in one of the ways that we're going to try here so what you have in front of you now is a chart by the office of justice programs again you can find this and much more valuable information uh, on their website and resources but we're going to look at saying instead of what um, what can you try saying that might be more trauma informed so instead of why did you or why didn't you try when a specific event happened what were your feelings or thoughts so when the when the sexual assault happened what were your feelings or thoughts when the burglary occurred what were your feelings or thoughts okay sort of broad open-ended questions we talked about this instead of why didn't you are you able to tell me more about what happened instead of start at the beginning and tell me what happened or how long did the assault last and other questions looking for a chronological account try where would you like to start or would you tell me what you were able to remember about your experience? Or what are you able to tell me about what was happening before the assault? Or what were you able to tell me about what was happening during the assault? Or what were you able to tell me about what was happening after the assault? All right. Instead of what were you wearing, try. Sometimes we can get valuable information from the clothes you were wearing, even if you put them through the laundry. We would like to collect the clothes you were wearing at the time of the assault as evidence. Can we pick those up? items up at a time or place that's convenient for you. Instead of, why did you go with a suspect? Try, can you describe what you were thinking and feeling when you went with the suspect? Or, do you think you led them on? Try, did the suspect's behavior change after you went with them? How did that make you feel? Instead of, why were you out at this time and location? Try, what are you able to tell me about what brought you to the location at that day or time? And I don't think that, that, that one might be maybe not necessarily much better, but maybe a little bit better, right? Like, what are you able to tell me? So again, opening the door, opening the, making more room for that person to let you know what they're thinking or feeling. Why didn't you leave? Instead of why didn't you leave, try, are you able to describe what was happening while you were in wherever you were in? Uh, instead of, did you say no? Try. What are you able to recall doing or saying during the incident? And how did the suspect respond to your words or actions? Do you remember how that made you feel? Instead of, did you fight back? Try. What did you feel like when you were, did you feel like you were physically capable of doing during the incident? What did you feel like you were physically capable of doing during the incident? Or what was going on in your mind when you realized you were in danger? Instead of, why didn't you report right away? Try, did anything in particular cause you to come tell us about this incident today? Or was there someone you trusted to tell about the incident after it occurred? When you told them, what were you thinking or feeling? Or what were you feeling physically and emotionally immediately after the assault? Instead of, did anyone see this happen? Try, can you tell me about any people or witnesses who might have seen you and the suspect together or who might have seen the incident? And can you tell me about any people or witnesses who might have seen you after the event? And can you share information with me on any friends or colleagues or classmates that might have noticed a change in your physical appearance or behavior after the assault? Like maybe you were withdrawn or sad or angry. Instead of, have you had sex with that, this person before? And we're assuming that this is a sexual assault. Try, or some sort of, uh, other sex crime, try, has this person done anything like this to you in the past? And instead of, are you dating or in a relationship with a person? Try, can you tell me how this instance was different
from any previous consensual sexual acts. All right, so with that, these are more trauma-informed ways of interviewing. So as you conduct interviews with victims, no matter the crime, uh, there might be trauma involved. And so being more conscientious about where they are at is a good first step. So in your MySBC, in addition to various other resources to check out regarding how to interview victims in a trauma-informed way, you'll note I've put in uh, a sexual assault checklist. This is an example of a sexual assault checklist uh, that uh, includes victim actions working through both identifying the victims but then also uh, beginning to interview the victims. I've also included a domestic violence policy checklist. Uh, say you are in a situation where maybe it's not sexual assault but it is domestic violence, something like that. And so those are available along with many other resources to further review for today's class within your MySBC. I did want to draw attention to the YouTube video that you see in front of you, Trauma-Informed Police Interview and Investigation Techniques to Improve Outcomes. So this is a Zoom class, actually, that was put on by Project Safe Neighborhoods. Uh, it was part of their training and technical assistance. And in this Zoom presentation, it's about an hour and a half long, uh, a professor of psychology from George Mason, as well as a retired detective from a Utah police department go through different ways to interview and investigate in a trauma-informed way and then talk a lot about how these sort of techniques do improve case outcomes. And so if you would like to learn more about that, and actually I'll suggest um, that as part of class, you might check that out. Uh, visit the URL that is linked uh, actually, you can copy it down from this video or simply go to YouTube and search. This is uh, by the National Center of Victims of Crime. So you could search for the National Center for Victims of Crime in YouTube and look for the trauma-informed police interview and investigation techniques to improve case outcomes. Uh, as with all of this, there are even more resources than I, than I can name. If you'd like anything in particular, you have uh, my contact information, and I am more than happy to track down additional resources to fill in the blanks in your learning and hopefully create a situation where if you become involved in an interview of a victim, uh, that you're able to do so in a trauma-informed way. Back to a earlier resource we discussed. Let's, let's look now at some of the sexual assault kit initiative, the Saki toolkit. This is another resource, great resource that's available freely online. As with all of these resources, this one was funded fed federally as well, I believe. Uh, and in here, there are multiple different scenarios, videos, webinars, etc., that you can use to learn yourself. Or if you get to the point inside a department or agency where you are teaching other people, which might provide some more information and resources to share with them. So there's a trauma-informed interview role-playing scenario. Oftentimes, I try to do this uh, or do scenarios like this in class. And this is one that we might have done for this class. Uh, but I recommend checking that out. There's also a video that goes along with it. Uh, there's a great video in here about how law enforcement can work with the victims of trauma. We're going to watch just the second of it at the beginning because I think it's a pretty useful start. Yeah. 
interesting. Yeah. She stops and she starts. She contradicts herself. She goes backwards and forwards. What she says doesn't make sense. Or when she's describing it, she's not crying. She's not upset. She's like totally flat. The victim that may appear, as to if she may not have the story all together. Often survivors are asked, well, why didn't you just run out the door or tell someone or scream or, or say no? Um, but what, what, has, um, what I've heard survivors talk about is um, feeling a sense of just even just frozen. There is no typical response to sexual assault. Okay, so actually, if you would pause, and here's the web address for this, you can pause this video, go to this web website and actually watch, go to um, the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, you can Google that if that's the easiest way, and you can type in how law enforcement can work with trauma, victims of trauma, or you can pause the video and type down this URL and go directly there. But take a second and watch this video, and we will come back to um, looking at some of the questions from this video in a second. So go ahead, launch that video, and watch it on your own, please. All right, so if you're back, I assume you've just watched that video on working with victims of sexual assault. And actually, I wanted to share within the Saki website this toolkit as well. It actually has a checklist of if you are going to be interviewing someone who's experienced a sexual assault, uh, the types of people who should be doing these interviews, like what their experience is, what their characteristics are, etc. And these are maybe best considered not only for sexual assaults, but for other really trauma-inducing type um, or interviews where trauma has occurred um so they suggest you know and you can print off your own copy of that checklist if you're interested or you know you can always find it online as i mentioned earlier it was actually the bureau of justice assistance so it was another federal funding that created this uh all these materials um experience they look at you know does the person who's conducting the interview have experience um, are they on temporary assignment? Have they received a prosecutor's endorsement? Uh, you know, are they victim focused? Are they even tempered and open minded? Why are these things necessary? Well, it's very nice for a victim, you know, to feel like someone's on their on their side and being super aggressive toward their aggressor, toward the person who, you know, did whatever they did to them, uh, perpetrated whatever potential crime, but having an even-tempered, sort of open-minded, level-headed interviewer really provides a sense of structure and safety in that interview, and that's pretty helpful. So looking at personal characteristics, or if it's somebody who ultimately is just going to, you know, bounce off the walls because this ha something similar happened to them, you know, really looking at the interviewer, making sure they have uh, some of these characteristics and that they have the knowledge, okay? So experience, personal characteristics, characteristics and the knowledge, the knowledge about rape and sexual assault, about potential forensic in, uh, analysis, about crime scene investigation. These are questions that the victim may have. And if they ask the interviewer and the interviewer just goes blank, um, you know, that's not necessarily instilling trust. If you are in an interview and someone asks you a question about some forensic procedure that you don't know about, it, the best way to handle that might be to just say, uh, look, let me write down this question. And as we go through this interview, I'll write down all these questions and then I'll get back to you and we'll go through the responses of these. But right now, I, I just wanna hear your story if that's okay. All right, something like that. Maybe you redirect and get things back on track without exposing the fact that you maybe don't know as much because certainly a victim's gonna want to be want to feel comfortable um, in what they say and want to know that they're saying it to somebody who has this type of knowledge. Skills and abilities. This is a quick part of this checklist. You know, can they conduct themselves um, or conduct comprehensive and complex interviews? Are they sensitive to public contacts? Are they tactful? Can they use the equipment in the room? Types of things like that. So this sexual assault checklist or sexual assault investigator checklist is maybe a good way to decide if you're a small department, oh, who's gonna go in the room with this victim? And that's available as well on the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative um, as part of that Saki. So 
after you've watched that video, let's work through uh, some key concepts from the video and see how it went, how what we remember. So what is the typical response to sexual assault? Crying, extreme distress, fear, anger, apathy? The answer is there is no typical response. Some people may shut down. Some people may be quiet. Some people may be crying, you know, torrential amounts. Some people might be angry. Some people might be, you know, like whatever. And none of that negates or changes the extremity of what happened to them. All right. So just like some people don't think they're victims, some people don't show their emotion in a typical way. So assuming that they should be one way or another doesn't mean that they aren't being honest with you about what they're going through. What is the typical response? Again, no right way. All right. No right way to respond to sexual assault. Second question, how does trauma affect the way victims remember things? Are they going to be able to tell you exactly the order in which things happened? Are they going to go right in their minds to the main event and then be able to tell you around it afterward? Um, yeah, they might not remember chronologically what happens. And this is why even though it's very useful for investigators to get a chronological picture, sometimes you've got to do that in your notes. You can jot down a little timeline and you can just make some notes, right? Or you can make a list and just start to fill in the gaps of like, okay, this happened here, this happened here. So as the interviewer investigator, this is kind of on you to put together the sequence of events. And what you want more than anything else is the most accurate and detailed picture that can be painted. And sometimes that's not painted in a straight line, right? Sometimes that jumps around a little bit. So victims might not be able to remember the event chronologically. Again, that doesn't mean one thing or another. They might also misremember at points. Um, and this is something when we talk about eyewitnesses, the potential for eyewitnesses to misremember is huge. And victims are in effect eyewitnesses to the, their own um, victimization, right? And so they might misremember too. It doesn't, again, mean that it negates uh, the entire, the entirety of what they're saying, just like with eyewitnesses, you know, maybe that part is cut out, but each part should be viewed independently. Um, and there might still be a lot of value there. Trauma affects the way victims remember things. It affects hormones in the brain. Uh, sexual assault, for example, might be stored in a really disorganized way in the brain. All right, so that goes along with don't expect people to have chronological recollections of their victimization. Why do victims sometimes have trouble recalling details? Details, details, details. Well, we talked about for half a second about how you know, sometimes victims remember time moving slowly. Sometimes victims remember time moving very quickly. Uh, and kind of along with that, some people might have difficulty remembering different types of experiences. Uh, certain hormones within your brain might make it difficult to affect, uh, to, I mean, some, so sorry, it might make it difficult to remember what occurred, all right? Uh, and that is indeed the case. There are hormones that are released when a sexual assault, for example, occurs. There are, you know, this is, a, this is sort of a, you know, all three of these might indeed be the case. Why do victims sometimes have trouble recalling? All right. But the main thing they're trying to lead us into here and what they talked about in the video was that in the cases of sexual assaults and other traumatic events, in particular, there are hormones that might be, have been released that actually uh, stop physical pain, help the body respond to trauma, and those hormones might affect memories. So there is, in addition to maybe what we might consider the other physical and emotional pieces of that or behavioral pieces of that, um, there's some actual other, you know, uh, psychophysical or, or however you'd like to say that uh, hormone effects that might be occurring. The flood of hormones uh, that helps people survive a traumatic event can impact all of these, all right? It can impact, I'm sure that's the answer, yes. Emotions, demeanor, memory, recall, all of it, all right? So again, you know, you're, you're trying to get the level of detail that your victim can provide, but recognizing that they truly might not remember something, even down to 
what the exact color of the shirt was, what the, you know, whatever else, okay? That these don't betray a uh, lack of the event happening or something that they, in fact, might show um, that this victim's brain was undergoing a traumatic response. Um, yeah, so they can impact a variety of behaviors. Trauma can impact, again, this would be an all the above one, right? How memories are stored, how things are recalled, how people tell other people about what happened. It has a giant effect, all right? And it's an actual uh, physiological effect, okay? True or false, the accuracy of the memory is likely questionable because of the way memory is stored during trauma. We already know this to be true, okay? Trauma affects how people comprehend, store, regulate, you know, all of these things, but as we discussed above, can really affect memory storage. So a victim comes through later and they says, I forgot to tell you this, but I actually remembered this piece of information. Are they lying? Uh, did they make a mistake? You know, uh, does it, you know, could it be a fictionalization? You know, what's going on here? Um, it's pretty common. It's pretty common for victims. And just like with eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses might remember something later, which is why you always want to leave an interview with an eyewitness with a opening for them to follow up with you, why you want to leave them with your card, why you want to make sure that if they have any other information, they relay it to you, right? So when you're talking to a victim, it's, it's very likely that they might uh, process what happened in a different way and come up with some new information, um, recall some new information later on. And so that should be a response which is expected. And again, when you close out an interview with the victim, say, you know, make it clear just as with uh, an interview with an eyewitness. And you can use some of that, uh, those checklists and those procedural guides that were provided during that section of this course about eyewitnesses. In regards to victims too, just do it in, uh, in the context of everything else we've discussed about the particulars of victims, okay? So one of those things though was after the interview, you know, thank you so much, conclude with them. Thank you so much for coming in today. You know, I really appreciate you being willing to have what I know is a difficult conversation. I, I know you'll probably think of some things that happened. I want you to not hesitate to shoot me an email or give me a phone call. Uh, here's my number, here's my email address. Um, just let me know if anything else comes to mind. And again, I really appreciate you coming in today. Leave them in a good way, okay? Walk them out of the building, that type of thing. They've undergone a trauma and they might've even sort of had to review uh, what that trauma was just, just then with you during the interview. So afterward, continuing on that level of comfort, safety, security, um, as they head out and providing them with knowing that you're open to hearing more information in the future is going to best help you ascertain what actually happened, right? Because you're gonna get um, potentially the most uh, available information from a cooperative and comfortable victim. All right, uh, if they come to you with more information, um, you know it, it might be part of that memory recall as well. So with that, we will wrap up uh, the lecture part of today's course.